Good morning. <coughs> Our scripture lesson th- this morning is found in Luke, the 15th chapter, uh, beginning at um, verse 1. Okay, <clears throat> let's begin with verse 11. <laughs> I looked at verse 1, and it's not where, where it should be. <clears throat> Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields in to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and fill it and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him, What is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a small young goat so I could celebrate with my friend. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May God bless to our hearing, to our understanding, and our daily living, the message found in this scripture. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
There is no better text on which to base a Father's Day sermon than the parable of the, par of the prodigal son, which occurs only in one place in the Bible, namely Luke 15, verses 11 to 32, which I just read. The word prodigal refers to one who abuses the gifts of grace. The story certainly involves the son, but its primary message pertains to the father. From the days of antiquity to the present, fathers have always been authority figures, both in the family and in the tribal community. The primacy of the father in the family is evidenced by each family member carrying the father's surname as a significant part of their identity, a practice that continues to the present day. Traditionally, fathers were highly respected, both within and beyond the boundaries of the family. The early Christian church designated those who had known the disciples as church fathers, that they designated them as church fathers. They alone were granted the authority to proclaim the teachings of Jesus. And thus the church fathers became the official teachers of the faith, and their authority was passed on through the action of ordination. Disagreements among the fathers were resolved then by a council of fathers meeting to resolve the disputes. And in both Western and Eastern Europe, the rise of the nation state soon marked growing disputes between the head of the state and that of the church, or in other words, the inescapable conflict between politics and religion. After the Emperor Constantine's conversion to the Christian faith in the fourth century and his eventual declaration of Christianity as the state religion, a potential conflict emerged between the head of the state and the head of the church and things remained under control as long as the emperor was a devoted Catholic, readily accepting the authority of the pope over all matters, both civil and religious. But after Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church and declared himself the supreme ruler over both the state and the church, the floodgates were open for the gradual emergence of Protestants declaring the separation of church and state, which gradually became our inheritance here in the so-called New World. The separation of the two meant that the king would be sovereign over all matters terrestrial, and the pope would be sovereign over all matters celestial. And soon the authority of the state became identified with the authority of the law, power and justice as divorce from love, compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. And similarly, the authority of the church became identified with the laws and decrees of the church, which were at times divorce from the virtues of love, compassion, and mercy. And thus, from the 16th century to the present, both Western Europe and the Americas have witnessed a continuous struggle between church and state, with both sides striving for dominance over the other. And whenever authority figures exercise power over love, justice, and compassion, they lose the respect of those whom they govern, and their governance, therefore, becomes arbitrary. During my first visit to Nigeria, where I lived later for three years, I vividly recalled my great shock in seeing children of all ages falling to their knees before their fathers and seeing men and women fully prostrate themselves on the ground before their village king. Recently, I saw video photos of large numbers of citizens in Thailand lying prostrate on the ground as the royal procession passed by. Uh, the act of um, curtsying 
before European royalty continues that tradition in a slightly modified way. Moreover, I stayed in African homes where younger brothers and sisters never address their senior siblings by their first names. Although such practices signify um, respect for seniority, the custom does designate severe lines of inequality and any um, breaking of those uh, procedures uh, can be issued issue in severe punishments. Up to the present age, titular heads of nations, cities, towns, and families have been men. Apart from the rarest occasions, women did not achieve such states until the late 20th century, and they continue to comprise the few rather than the many. But hopefully, as time goes on, uh, things will balance out. That is our hope. Now, Jesus' story of the prodigal son is arguably the best known of all of his parables because it is so readily understandable by all who have ever heard it. And though all who know um, that they will receive, all who receive an inheritance have known it in advance, and most times that's the case. But few, if any, ever ask for their share in advance, as did the younger of the two sons in this story. But surprisingly, the father listened to the younger son, and even more surprisingly, granted his request. Predictably, the son left home and soon squandered his inheritance in unrestrained living. And sadly, his wasteful style of life soon depleted all of his resources. And in the midst of a famine, he found himself at the lowest ebb of life and forced to take a job feeding pigs, which is the lowest form of work that a Jew could do, because God had declared long ago that Jews should not eat pigs. Finally, while reflecting on his very low estate, he recalled that even his father's servants had a better life than he, because they had both shelter and more than enough food to eat. And thus he decided to swallow his pride and return to his father's estate, confess his waywardness, admit that he is no longer worthy to be called his father's son, and beg his father to hire him as a servant. And much to his great surprise, however, when the father saw him coming from a distance, he ran to meet him and threw his arms around him and welcomed him back home while telling his servants to bring a robe for him, slippers for his feet, and place a ring on his hand and kill the fatted calf as a gesture of celebration. And alas, the older son, who had been away working in the fields, and we understand the sentiments of the older son very well, returned home in the midst of the rivalry, revelry. And after asking the servant what was going on, he was told that his father was celebrating his son's return home. And that angered the older brother to such an extent that he refused to go into the house. And finally, he confronted his father and said that he had been a faithful son all of his life and nothing was ever done to celebrate him. But the younger son, who had squandered his resources, was being honored and celebrated with a lavish party. And his father then said to him that he had been with him always, and hence there was no need to celebrate his return. Further, everything the father has is his, but his brother was believed to be dead and is now alive, and that is worth celebrating. 
And whether the other elder son ever saw things differently is not the point of the story. Rather, the story is about a father who is willing to forgive and celebrate his lost son's return home, which delighted him to no end. Most important, Jesus used that story to describe the character of the most powerful of all beings, our Creator God, who is not only powerful, but is loving and forgiving, always ready to welcome the wayward back home after they have reported, um, after they have repented from abusing God's grace. And though the story's focus is on the prodigal son, its positive message is not that of the son's wayward choice of life, but the father's forgiving grace, deeply rooted in his continuing love, which is always ready to forgive unconditionally and welcome back the wayward child with abundant joy. Evangelicals have made great use of this text in their calls for repentance from sin and conversion to Christian discipleship. But that can easily overlook the father's abiding love for a child who has gone astray and eventually returns home, much to the joy of his father. That simple story of love, mercy, and forgiveness depicts God's fatherly love better than anything else. And finally, I want to play a short clip of a contemporary father and his great love for his transgender child. The father, the Reverend Mac Schaefer, was a former student of mine at Princeton Theological Seminary. I was his advisor on a thesis that compared the civil rights movement in the United States uh, with the uh, struggle for civil rights uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, I was invited by him uh, later to preach his ordination sermon uh, at the Presbyterian Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. He and his wife Katie's first child, first of four children, named Hunter, was transgender, though assigned masculine at birth. And when Hunter came to his parents in his early teens, came out to his parents in his early teens, they were very supportive. And Hunter's father held a press conference alongside Hunter, who was a high school plaintiff in a lawsuit against North Carolina's pending bathroom law called HB2. That act marked Mac and Katie Schaefer's full commitment to the LBGTQ UIA plus community struggle for justice, freedom, and liberation for all. No other reason than that, for no other reason than that they are God's creation, that trans people and all people are God's creation who loves them beyond their wildest imagination. Let us hear the clip. Father, Hunter is one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. She is transgender and knows who she is at the core of her very being. I support her and all the plaintiffs in their pursuit of justice, and particularly today, the injunction. Rarely do I believe that fear is a good motivator. As a father and as a Presbyterian minister, I believe fear builds barriers between people and communities. I be believe HB2 legislation is constructed on unfounded fear. Our human stories bring us together and help us create relationships. Our shared human stories reduce fear. 
They help us to grow in our understanding of one another. I think if more people took the time to listen to Hunter's story and the stories of other people up here today, they would see that there really isn't room for fear or legislation like HB2. They would see human beings who simply want the same rights as everyone else. Fear-based legislation is paralyzing to society and a dead end for a diverse human population. Love and relationships open doorways of hope and learning and growth. Hunter is my firstborn daughter and she is loved beyond her wildest imagination. Once again, the message there is not about Hunter, but about the father's love for Hunter. Now the floor is open for conversation, responses, whatever your responses might be. Um, many times in that verse we're thinking of God as the father and then we are on one side or the other of the sons but that clip is the reminder that we are also sometimes the father It's interesting how sometimes these Bible verses, they're so familiar, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I never thought of that before. <laughs> and what hit me this time was the fact that the father started this celebration. He was so happy that I'm sure that this being away in the fields, the states were so big, maybe it was going to take two days or whatever. But he started it without the other son being there. You know, he didn't say, let's wait for the, you know, your brother to get back. He just started the celebration and that was, I think, the expression of the joy of having this child back and, you know, wanting to celebrate. And, uh, and then, of course, we get the other son's perspective. But I never really thought of that. I mean, you know, Today, if we think of a celebration, it's like, well, let's include everybody. You know, let's wait until everybody can get here before we do it. And that wasn't what it was. It was, you know, we wanted to celebrate it now. And uh, I think when we think about, you know, our relationship with God, you know, we want to have God, you know, we want to have it be in conversation with God now or whatever it is, like immediately and not wait. So that's what I got from that. The other interesting thing is the father made a uh, maybe he didn't make an assumption. He was celebrating before the guy, the, f the prodigal son even came back. He didn't even necessarily know. I mean, the prodigal son was remorseful, we know in the story, but he could have been coming back to ask for more money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he was just happy he was alive. He, no cell phones, nothing, so he didn't know where he was. Like they said, you know, he, we thought he was dead. Um, and figuratively, he was dead. But he was going to celebrate even if the guy was asking for more. I've spent everything, and I want more. It was that. It was the complete unconditional, I'm just so glad to see you. Before the, father, before the son even confessed his wrongdoing, yeah. the father had embraced him and the show was To 
You keep calling me Justin. That's the second <laughs> time. <laughs> but um, I just think it's interesting with, um, with that clip is that um, I feel like most of these generation of parents nowadays only focus on probably just the sexualities or just worry about the sexualities of their kids where they either just either um, disown them or they don't love them or just don't care about them anymore. So it's it's still good to know that there's some parents out there that, that don't care at all and actually care about more of their character and personality than than just some sexuality. So I <laughs> I feel like it's just great that um, like, uh, I'm sorry for doing this wrong thing, but he's just happy that he's alive, that he's well, and that he's doing good, so. I just wanted to touch on that video clip, and I don't have anything too great to say about it other than I just don't personally know what to think about it in, like, uh, it just doesn't process for me seeing a parent not just like tolerate their kids gender identity but actively go out of their way to advocate for it because I'm trans I've known so many other trans people around my age I've known over 20 and the best we have gotten from parents is turning a blind eye and so it's so weird for me to see like the idea of a parent actively advocating on their kids behalf even if it's not an issue they personally share and i'm like it's just very quiet <laughs> I think it's also such a powerful image of fathers um, in this light. Um, when you told me the passage, Peter, I was like, oh yeah, like that makes complete sense. I think often the passages that are used for Father's Day or for fatherhood in general are always the kind of image of a father as dominating or commanding or having expectations or inspiring like strength and courage and all these great things but can so easily be abused when it comes to power and you know the power we have over others and so it's just so nice to see such a soft such a um, counter-cultural example of fatherhood um, in your message and also in that clip um, and I was getting emotional watching it because I I also like was struggling to process it, <laughs> um, struggling to um, to see how real this is. Um, a man in a patriarchal society um, who often, you know, uh, is is taught and socialized to to be the opposite um, is is hard to process. And it's a beautiful image of God, and it's a beautiful image of what uh, masculinity can look like. So, thank you for lifting that up. Well, I think you all got the message very well, and uh, the message is still there for others to see and to read. So go to Luke uh, 15 um, and, and find it, as I had difficulty at the beginning in finding it. <laughs> I thought, I was thinking that it began verse 1, but it didn't, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>